Good evening and welcome again to the virtual John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Kareen Hajar and I am the chair of the Fellows and Study Group Program. I'm a senior in Elliott House studying government, data science, and economics. Each semester here at the IOP, we host a diverse cohort of fellows who teach and mentor, but also learn from students across the Harvard community. Normally, residential fellows live on campus and lead students in political discourse by way of their weekly study groups. However, this is not a regular semester. Despite the virtual environment, the IOP is privileged to welcome six fellows who will continue to engage and interact with students during this historic year. With the global pandemic, economic uncertainty, race, a racial justice reckoning, and a presidential election like no other just around the corner, there is no shortage of topics to cover this semester. Our fellows, some old and some new, will help students grapple with these issues while inspiring them to pursue a life of public service that engages with the very challenges we'll be talking about in the next few months. Over the course of the semester, fellows will continue will continue traditional cornerstones of the fellowship virtually. The Institute will convene virtual study groups led by fellows twice a week on pressing topics, including the election, the fight for social and racial ju justice, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. As tradition, fellows will immerse themselves in the Harvard community by mentoring a cohort of undergraduate students, holding weekly virtual office hours, and engaging faculty and co-curricular activities. As I enter my senior year, I look back on my time in FSG with gratitude. Gratitude for the conversations that changed my mind, gratitude for a community built on a shared desire to improve this country, and gratitude for the friendships I have made with fellows and students alike. I encourage all Harvard students to apply to be a part of the FSG team. Now more than ever, it's the knowledge and friendship built here that will make a difference in this divided country. A computer screen will not hinder the FSG, FSG's thoughtful discourse and vibrant community. As long as there are political challenges to discuss and injustices to correct, the fellows program will stand to create a space for thoughtful discourse. With that said, I wanna thank our fellows for bravely accepting the challenge of this semester and forging onward, knowing there is important work to be done. Our first fellow, Chastin Buttigieg, is an author and LGBTQ plus advocate who received his bachelor's degree in theater and global studies from the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and his master's in education from DePaul University. He has worked as a busboy, dog walker, nursing assistant, waiter, cashier, bartender, and most recently, a middle school drama and humanities teacher. Our next fellow, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, is a social justice activist, educator, and writer. Leading at the intersection of culture and justice, she has, has and continues to build platforms to amplify, educate, and activate everyday people to take transformative action against every form of injustice. Next is Carol Giacomo, who was a member of the New York Times editorial board from 20, 2007 to 2020, writing opinion pieces about all major national security issues, including nuclear weapons, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Mayor Michael Nutter, who, serves as, who served as the 98th mayor of the city of Philadelphia, and as mayor, he managed the city of Philadelphia through the Great Recession, and the city's credit rating was upgraded to A by the three major credit agencies for the first time since the 1970s. Next is Alice Stewart, a CNN political commentator, communications consultant, veteran senior communications advisor on numerous presidential campaigns, and an Emmy award-winning journalist. Finally, we have Jorge L. Vasquez Jr., the director of the Power and Democracy Program with Advancement Project, a national nonpartisan multiracial policy communications and legal action organization. Last but not least, we're fortunate to have our conversation moderated tonight by the IOP's director, Mr. Mark Guerin. To our fantastic fellows, welcome and welcome back to Harvard. Well, thank you, Karine, very much for that those great introductions for your thoughtful remarks and really importantly for your leadership uh, now as chair and with Eric Jemba last semester really working to have conversations with our fellows. So we thank you for all that you bring to the Institute of Politics and your really thoughtful observations about the fellows program and what it's meant 
uh, for your undergraduate career. And I join with you in welcoming this great group of fellows, fantastic group, those who uh, are new to the Institute of Politics and those who have had some experience with us as uh, fellows in, in previous semesters. But this complement, this hybrid of those new to the Institute and those who have some experience with us, we felt was with our student leaders, a perfect way to go into this semester, which as Kareen says, is unlike any other. The combination of fresh perspective and understanding Harvard will serve our students very well. And I can tell you just to our audience and listeners from the first few days we've had of orientation, it's already a fun group. They have uh, joined forces together in, in fun ways. And I think tonight will be uh, very much reflective of the kind of spirit that the fellows program has had for, for many decades at the Institute of Politics. So thank you. Uh, let me welcome all the members of the class of 24, 2024, those first year students starting their journey at Harvard. We warmly welcome you. We hope you'll get involved at the Institute of Politics. Our common app is, is, is out there with a fellows program and other programs that exist across the landscape of the Institute of Politics. This has been a, a busy week already. We've already had three forums. Uh, here at the Institute. So the semester is kicking off with a kind of important conversations. Uh, and tonight, no exception, particularly as we look to just in eight weeks, the election. And as Karine said, the impact of uh, COVID-19, the reckoning of issues in and around racial and social justice. We have much to talk about this evening with our very distinguished group of six fellows. So thank you for, for being with us. Um, before we start, though, certainly our thoughts are also with our fellow citizens in the American West who are dealing with the ravages of the fires from California through Oregon and Washington and Colorado. Um, and we're thinking of them and prayerfully wishing them all the very best at this stressful and challenging time. And on the eve of 9-11, we also remember those citizens who lost their lives 19 years ago and their families who to this day uh, share that grief and that loss. And our thoughts are with them. Um, but tonight we have an opportunity in this busy week uh, to get to know our fellows better so that our students and community members will have the chance to engage with them in their study groups, as Crane said, in their office hours. Uh, so we'll dive right into these conversations and we look forward to the questions uh, from the audience uh, that you can raise your question individually to our distinguished group of fellows uh, or collectively, depending on the nature of your question. So let me um, begin in welcoming all of you. It's good to see you all in this little uh, series of Zoom meetings that we've had all week, but uh, from elected leadership with Amir Nutter to activism with Brittany and Jorge to journalism uh, and political activity with Alice and Chastin and Carol, what you bring. So we have a great range and span of careers and professional experiences. So I think I'll start alphabetically. Chastin, you're up first. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. Welcome to my kitchen. I, where are you zooming in from? Uh, I'm up in my hometown right now, actually. I'm in Traverse City, Michigan. Nice, nice. It looks like a very nice kitchen. And congratulations on your new book. I just Thank knew you. that you moved along in the New York Times best-selling author. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. I, we can include that in the bio now, right next to Dog Walker. That, that, that's right. That's right. Well, fit right. well let, me, let me start there because I've heard you reflect about your journey that your book speaks to, but also in this week here at the Institute of Politics, um, that before you felt politics was something that just happened to you. Mm -hmm. in your journey on the campaign and the presidential primary campaign gave you a perspective of politics as being personal. So could you reflect on that in the journey and some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of the study groups and how you'll bring uh, that experience in the arc of your life to our study groups here at the IOP? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I grew up in, in Northern Michigan, a pretty conservative place. It was just a fact that you couldn't be out uh, it was an unsafe place to be, I mean, uh, feeling that something about me was twisted and broken simply because of how homophobic it was around here at the time. Uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer when I was in high school, and I watched her navigate the American healthcare system and many things that influenced my life that, that shaped me into who I am. 
uh, had me thinking that the people making those decisions uh, who were making life harder did not care about people like me, did not care about people like my mother. Uh, and I, you know, I even went off to, to school and just had an idea of who politicians were and what they cared about. I never felt like it was something that I could take part in, never felt invited uh, really into the conversation and, and felt like the arena was a place I belonged in. Uh, and of course, I and then met somebody who, who changed my life forever, um, fell in love with a politician. I don't know if I would advise it, but uh, it's worked out for me. Um, you know, and then five years later, we're married and, and he's running for president. And when we were out on the campaign trail, uh, I really felt like an imposter for a few months that there's, there's no way I can, you know, fulfill this role. There's no way I could be first gentleman of the United States. I, I don't belong in this conversation. And then I spent a lot of time in Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada talking to people, sharing my vulnerabilities and listening to their concerns and realizing that you don't have to be something uh, a politician, you have to be yourself. And people have to see themselves reflected in your message and your campaign. And so I just started opening up about, you know, going to college and navigating college as a first generation college student, feeling left out, feeling broken, feeling like this country isn't a place for me. And the more I went out there and did it, the more uh, successful. I was, and I think successful at bringing people into our campaign because uh, I stopped thinking about what I was supposed to be as a political spouse. And I was just myself. And I realized all these things that shaped me or influenced me for better, for worse, really uh, helped me be what, what, what people started writing as, you know, Peter's uh, secret weapon. Um, yeah. Because people just need to feel seen and loved. Uh, and so, all of those things that uh, happened along the way, I think we're there for a purpose. Um, and at the end of the day, um, that is what I think uh, was reflected in my work on the campaign trail, just a, a, a wanting to help people feel understood. And so in your study group, you'll want to talk through that with and, and have guests and visitors and reflect on your experience um, through the campaign trail, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, politics is personal. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about social media. We're going to talk uh, with some folks from the campaign about how we built uh, a really uh, historic making a uh, campaign in Iowa um, using relational organizing, talking to people about everyday lives. Um, but we're also going to talk about our own personal narratives and, and like I harness the power of my own personal narrative, helping people, hopefully our students understand uh, the why, why am I here? Why am I doing what I am doing? And how is that going to influence uh, and change other people's lives? Great. I look forward to it. Thank you. We're excited to have you here. It's great to have you with us. Um, Brittany, we welcome you warmly back to the IOP. Brittany Packton Cunningham is been a resident fellow and a director's leader. And so we're grateful to have your, your perspective and your voice uh, with us this semester, Brittany. It's great to have you back. Thanks, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad I'm not at the end of the, the, end of the alphabet anymore. Got That's, right. That's right, that's <laughs> right. The, the, uh, the marriage moved you right up to the seas, right? There you go. Finally, my whole life, all the way at the end, this is the whole new experience now. Jackson, and this is beautiful, what you've experienced your whole life. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, um, with our thanks, so you joined us this summer for a community conversation that we had at the IOP after the murder of, of George Floyd, and certainly your own journey going back to Ferguson, the uprising in 2014, very involved with the issues in and around police brutality. And obviously in the considerable uh, events of this summer. And as you look at that period of time from, from your early days um, in activism in Ferguson, back in your native Missouri, um, how do you see this moment? And how do you see this summer? Because you've talked about the summer, the importance of protest to work for structural and important change. And where do you see this, or how might this be informing or impacting the presidential campaign this fall? Yeah, so um, first of all, so, so glad to be back um, with the returners that I know and the uh, new fellows that I'm getting to know and with the incredible student team that the IOP always assembles. Um, I'm looking forward to this semester having conversations, more conversations like this and doing my own fair share of learning and listening as well. Um, I get this question a lot, Mark, and that people want to be able to 
situate and create a container for how they should understand this particular moment. And I think that there are, are, are three important things. First is the historical context. Second, to your point, is the electoral context. But third, I think, is about what it has to mean for all of us. And the historical context is that there has been a protracted freedom struggle in this country. Um, and it has been led by all people who have experienced intentional marginalization. So we're talking about indigenous people that lived on this land before it was colonized. We're talking about black people who were enslaved um, uh, all across the Americas, let's be very clear, not just in North America. Um, we're talking about uh, women who, who uh, and, and especially women of color, who uh, only saw any kind of rights if they had relationship to the right kind Kind of man. Um, we're talking about LGBTQ folks. We're talking about disabled folks. We're talking about people who live at the intersections of all those identities and more. Um, and this chapter in the freedom struggle, frankly, if you study history, is to be expected. That there's only so much repression and frustration and degradation and injustice that people can face generation after generation after generation on before it boils over each generation, right? So what we are experiencing right now is uh, the manifestation of several years, yes, decades and generations, but in this current chapter, several years of really diligent organizing um, a lot of writing, a lot of expanding a narrative. You know, in 2014, we couldn't even uh, get people to recognize that police violence wasn't an aberration, that the conversation then was not about systems, right? We kept hearing the phrase bad apples. Now we're understanding that actually we're talking about uh, not even flawed systems, but systems that are working as they were functionally designed to work. And therefore, because we're having a different conversation about what is, we are able to have a different conversation about what can be. These are the kinds of transitions that we've seen over the last six or seven years. And all of those are a result of painstaking work of the folks who got on television and talked about it differently, of the folks who got in newspapers and wrote about it differently, of the organizers who dreamed up different solutions than the ones we had been trying out year after year, of the elected officials who said, I never thought to Jackson's point politics would be for me, but actually I need to get in the arena and make a voice like mine uh, be heard at the at the decision making table. Um, so the the all of that work over the last several years has brought us to a mo moment where more people are ready to actually utter the phrase Black Lives Matter. If you remember in the 2016 presidential election, it was like pulling teeth to get any of the Democratic uh, uh, um, contenders to say that for the most part. Um, and now we're at a place where it is actually a prerequisite. And that if you are a Democratic contender and you didn't say it, then uh, you'd have hell to pay. Um, we, so we're now at a, at a place where that is a, a, a much more common and accepted phrase. But we're also in this current moment at a place um, where we're experiencing some of what our elders and ancestors experienced in the mid-century civil rights movement in the perversion and misinformation about what this movement is and how we operate. There are um, a number of narratives about law and order and about um, uh, criminals and thugs that are deeply racialized and deeply inaccurate. Um, as you might hear some of the rhetoric out there in the world, it is important to remember that of the protests across the country over the last several months, 93% of them have been completely without incident. Um, and the 7% that were with incident, many of them were actually perpetuated not by people who proclaimed to stand for racial uh, justice, but actually by people who were looking to exploit the protests tests of this summer. Um, white supremacists, boogaloo boys, a chaos agents, lots of people who are not interested in, in accountability for people like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Tony McDade, but people who wanted to come and take advantage of the moment. Um, and so we are dealing with trying the, the push and pull of trying to advance the cause of racial justice on one hand, and also trying to defend the honor and dignity of a movement that 
is uh, is being upheld by thousands of people whose lives are continuously endangered, not just when they stand out on the street, but when that kind of rhetoric persists and we're all seen as uh, un-American when in reality, we are doing the most patriotic thing that there is, which is trying to make the country we live in the best it can possibly be. Um, that is what our Declaration of Independence not only tells us we can do, but requires that we should do when our institutions are not serving the people. So in this moment of the election, I think we have to be very careful to make sure that the conversations we are having with our loved ones, in our social media spaces, in any place where we hold power, whether it's our house or our dorm or our church or our synagogue, that we are having accurate and loving conversations about the justice that Black people and all people deserve. Um, which brings me, I think, to the, the third really important thing about understanding this moment. There's the historical piece, there's the relationship to the election. But what it means is that we have to have the courage to imagine the world as it can be and then actually go build it brick by brick, day by day, moment by moment. Um, there are uh, concepts of what is possible now around reimagining public safety, around uh, moving money from policing departments into social services that actually prevent crime instead of just funding police departments to punish crime after it has supposedly already happened. These are ideas that have been seeded over generations that are just now starting to spring forth. So we have to be the folks who are willing to look out 5, 10, 50 years ahead and say, what are the things that we can imagine can be true of that moment that right now feel totally uh, impossible, but are necessary to begin to design. And I think that when we look at the courage of people in this moment, we can be inspired to really diligently and in a disciplined way do exactly that. Terrific. Well, this will be an important series of discussions you'll have here. And we're so glad to have you back to, to share all of that with us. Thank you, Brittany. Thank um, you. Carol, we warmly welcome you. You bring a perspective of uh, literally traveling the world. I've heard you say that it's easier to name the countries that you haven't been to than the ones you've had, uh, covering 11 secretaries of state and traveling with eight of them. So your perspective uh, in a global context uh, in having covered uh, important moments in, in our history with secretaries of state, and then reflecting on them for the New York Times editorial uh, page will really be important conversations. But I'd like to just get your sense in terms of what you wanna to bring to the study groups and how you reflect on America's position in the world, literally every day today from North Korea to hacking stories of China and Iran to Russia. But where do you see, how do you think about now America's role in the world, given the arc of history that you've covered and from Secretaries of State Schultz to Pompeo? Uh, you know, I was raised to lead a purposeful life. And I learned, uh, I decided at a very early age, I was 12, when I decided I was going to be a journalist. I love to write, I love politics, and I was absolutely, I, I internalized very early how important democracy is and how it needs to be protected. And I uh, never really wanted to go into politics myself, but I really believed that a free press was uh, an absolute, uh, and this is not an original thought since Jefferson and, and Ben Franklin and a lot of other of our forefathers um, made it clear that they felt that a free, free press was essential to democracy. Um, so, and I, I grew up in an era I was young when John F. Kennedy was president and uh, you know, we can have an argument about some of his policies, but he had a vision about American leadership in the world, and he was an inspiring leader. And uh, so this influenced me going forward. And frankly, I would have never expected that we would be where we are today, where not just that the press is criticized. I mean, that's part of the business. Um, that's part of the relationship when you try to hold the powerful accountable, but we're 
actually being denigrated as an delegitimized as an institution, uh, which is ultimately not going to serve us well if we allow it to continue. Um, in the same respect, I, as a journalist, I started uh, I started at a local level covering the town of Dracut, which is north of where you guys are now. And, uh, you know, I wrote about the Sewage Commission and the Board of Education and the Town Council and the Housing Inspector. And, and then I followed that local government uh, path for a very long time until I got to Washington and had an opportunity for Reuters to cover uh, foreign and uh, foreign policy and defense policy. And uh, and still, all those years covering Schultz, you know, you'd go someplace with Schultz or with Baker and, you know, uh, with Condi Rice, with Powell. I mean, American secretaries of state really had clout. And they had clout because the United States had clout and was playing a leading role in the world. And today, uh, we are in very uh, dire straits. Our, we've alienated our allies. We have torn up treaties. We have receded really from the world stage in significant ways. And, uh, and, and that, that's a hard, <laughs> it's a hard truth to see. And it's going to be harder to recapture that leadership uh, in the future, um, you know, there, there's just, and, and people sort of, a lot of people think, well, you know, foreign policy, it's not directly related to me on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know what, how America functions in the world, whether the Americans can be a leading force for dealing with the pandemic, for instance, whether we can be a leading force for reigning in nuclear weapons, that has direct impact on Americans. Whether we can negotiate trade deals that really are um, benefit American producers, American people, um, that that hits the farmers in Iowa, that hits, you know, the grape growers in California and the tech business as well. So um, it's intrinsic to who we are as a country. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get back in a position where we preserve our security with a saner policy towards the world. I think there'll be uh, a lot of interest uh, in the, your study group as you unpack these issues and think about them on the global stage. So we're excited to have you here. Let me turn to Mayor Nutter. Uh, Mayor Nutter, we welcome you back to the Institute of Politics. We thank you for your own public service as an elected official. I'd like to have you reflect on uh, your year's uh, perspective as a mayor and city councilor and kind of given what cities are at the hub of. Uh, as we look to the issues or the from the pandemic to the issues of uh, racial reckoning in our country and activism that we've seen in cities. Um, I would like your perspective of what mayors are currently viewing and how you will inform your study groups as a as a former prominent mayor in our country. Well, Mark, thank you. And uh, thanks to the whole team. And uh, again, it can, it's just great uh, to uh, to be with this group of fellows. Um, you know, I think the confluence, uh, if you will, of the uh, pandemic, um, civil unrest, economic strife, uh, and the presidential election uh, is a reminder that cities still matter, uh, that the activities that are taking place in this country, small, medium, and large, uh, more oftentimes than not, uh, folks are protesting in cities. Uh, they are not uh, with every respect, and you know, it's a big country, um, but they are generally not out in some field uh, somewhere. They are in neighborhoods. They are in the downtown. They are in uh, places where their voices uh, can be heard and need to be heard, and exercising uh, their rights. And so, if you're a mayor, um, you know, a couple things. Uh, are certainly true. Uh, first and foremost, uh, many of us uh, went through what was then uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression uh, in uh, 08, 09, 10, 11, and to 12. And uh, many cities were still recovering when the pandemic hit. And then mayors and governors, not the 
the current occupant of the White House, mayors and governors, had to shut their locales down because they actually have that authority uh, and not uh, the person in the White House. And so that's a tremendous amount of responsibility. In 2008, 9, 10, 11, we didn't close businesses. Uh, they may have shut down on their own because of the economic crisis. But in this instance, the government actually put people out of work, closed companies for the sake of uh, public health and public safety uh, with a pandemic. Uh, they will suffer the consequences, right decision, but, but they will suffer the consequences uh, of those actions for a long period of time, uh, certainly without uh, further support uh, from the federal government. I find it amazing uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the Congress, uh, wild horses could not stop the Congress uh, from passing uh, PPP uh, or the CARES Act, and I have no issue with any of those. Uh, they could have done some other things, but okay, fine. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, I think they were on the third bill or the fourth bill, uh, and then suddenly people said, well, you know, what about cities uh, and states and counties and, and local governments? And uh, the leader of uh, the uh, uh, majority leader said, well, we need to take a pause on that. And let, let's kind of see what happens. Uh, well, what happened uh, is that the $600 additional unemployment benefit expired uh, with no response uh, from the Congress, that uh, uh, cities continued and states, in many instances, were literally bidding against each other uh, for needed uh, equipment and supplies. Uh, it was, uh, you know, some bad combination of uh, Game of Thrones and the Hunger Games, uh, where, I mean, they were literally at each other. And then as Americans, we're in the supermarket, you know, folks are putting up, you know, you can only buy two cartons of eggs and this limit on milk and how many rolls of towels you can get and a variety of other things. And so the pandemic has revealed every fault, every deficiency uh, in our systems all across the United States of America. In the meantime, um, mayors have to manage that uh, with fewer resources and virtually no help uh, from uh, the federal government. Citizens, on the other hand, um, you know, they really do still expect their traffic to get picked up. Uh, they want the traffic signals to work. They wonder, what am I going to do? You know, we've transitioned from the winter into spring into summer. What am I doing, you know, with my child who normally would go to summer camp or, you know, some other uh, kind of activity? So cities still have to run. And what we find is that real leadership uh, is being practiced at the local level uh, and mayors stepping up in so many, many instances uh, either partnering with their governors in some instances or finding themselves fighting with the federal government. Mm -hmm. That American troops uh, would be uh, uh, deployed, uh, uh, not overseas, uh, but to cities in this country uh, is absolutely, uh, you know, we, we haven't seen that in a long, long uh, period of time. And in many instances, I think, uh, Brittany touched on it. In many instances, they provoked violence. They didn't stop violence. Uh, and you know, we'll have some debate about whether or not that was uh, intentional or not. I mean, I won't be debating it. Some other people will, because I think I know. Uh, so I mean, those are the kinds of things that, that I want to look at, because in cities, all of these things, they don't happen in a serial fashion. Uh, right. They happen all at the same time. Right. And then you have to manage it. That's great. Well, it's great to have you here. And the perspective as from eight years as mayor will be really valuable in our study group conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alice Stewart, welcome back as well to the Institute of Politics. We're excited to have you back. Um, let me turn as a campaign operative. You've been directing comms for four Republican presidential candidates. So you have great experience in this. But this election is so different. Uh, speeches are via Zoom, text banks, instead of door knocking um, in this COVID environment. Um, how would you advise candidates in this context? And how do you think about that, about getting the word out in terms of their messages in the candidates? And how will you be informing your study groups about those kinds of issues? Well, thank you for the question, Mark. And it's uh, great to be here with these great fellows and uh, you students. and. Um, 
uh, address that question in, in one second. I do want to mention this. It was one year ago when I was at the Kennedy School with the other fellows, and we were talking about the students in the audience and how we had to remind ourselves that you students were were post 9-11. You haven't known a world before TSA and 9-11. And then here it is a year later and you're dealing with a pandemic and racial strife and economic tensions. And um, I just want to say that all of us fellows have had this conversation that we um, uh, commend you for, for your strength and your resolve to, to really embrace the new way we're going about learning. And we're there to, to help and um, make it uh, educational for you, but we all recognize we're going to learn more from you than we could possibly teach you. So thanks everyone for, for tuning in. And, um, to your question, Mark, the campaigns need to obviously recognize that um, we're in a situation where we can't, we can't ignore, you know, the, the key issues of our time and people are concerned with with healthcare, which is COVID, they're concerned with national security and security, which is uh, a lot of what we're seeing in the streets uh, and the economy. And that ties in with what we're seeing with the economic uh, strife that we're going in this country. And they need to address those issues and, and they need to talk about that, which what American people are, are concerned with. And they don't need to get bogged down with uh, Twitter wars and chasing the headlines. They need to talk with the people uh, about what they're concerned with. And Chaston knows well, very well, when you go to Iowa, they're concerned about putting food on the table and they're concerned about how they're going to safely put their kids back in school. And, and those are the concerns that they want to hear about. And I would certainly encourage both of the campaigns to, to address what the people are concerned with and not chase down what the media wants to talk about and to stay on message and stay off Twitter and do all you can to engage. A lot of people don't want to go out. A lot of people are, are fine with, with staying in virtual chats, virtual town halls with the candidates, uh, watching what they can on television and reading what they can in the paper. But to the degree that a, a campaign can go out there and uh, do rallies and speak to people in a safe way with social distancing, with masks and, and with the proper safety precautions because voters want to sense a person's um, genuine nature. And I think uh, Joe Biden is very genuine and very uh, empathetic. And that's something that he can really exude when he goes out and speaks to people. Um, President Trump loves the rally and the, the pep rally effect of things, but they need to do a, a really good balance of, of embracing what we have to deal with, which is the virtual nature of how we communicate, but they still need to do the retail politics um, and go out there in a safe way and, and address the people. And that, that a good combination of that is good, but talk, talk about what the people want to talk about, not what you think that it is important. And what, what I'm going to talk about in my, in my study group is, is kind of a combination of, of those things. Um, addressing the media. I've got some uh, media folks coming to my study group uh, and as well as uh, people from each of the campaigns. And there's three things that I, I really will focus on. Is, you know, where's the me in the media? Um, don't let the passion outweigh your policies. And let's have conversation without confrontation. And uh, I think it's important that the media in the way they cover these politics really addresses what people in these flyover countries are, are concerned with. And we'll talk with some that are doing just that uh, on a great show, The Circus on Showtime. And we'll be talking with them next week. Uh, and, and also there's so much passion and so much uh, energy and frustration uh, I do think it's important that we, we also don't lose hold of where our policies are, where our convictions are, where our political ideology is, and don't get um, tied up in the uh, uh, ideology of, of, of silos. Really make sure you hold on to your where you are and, and, and make sure that, that you stand your ground and, and try to get past this emotional chaos that we're in. And let's have these conversations in a respectful way uh, with civility. And one thing I, I like to say, I steal this line, but I'm not as concerned with what your true north is, but that you have one 
and let's find where we can agree on, on issues and have civil conversations. Well, we, we're excited to have you back and excited to have the conversations and your real world uh, campaign experience will be really enlivening the study groups. Thank you, Alice. Um, and finally, Jorge, welcome. It's great to have you here and we're gonna be going to student questions next, but let me um, ask you, cause your life has really operated at a important intersection of law and advocacy and activism. You've um, written uh, important um, pieces and op-ed pieces that were uh, notable on immigration laws, <clears throat> particularly vis-a-vis -vis the census. And as we looked at this election and looking at the rise of the Latinx population and demographic and voting bloc, how do you think about those issues and how will that inform your study groups? First, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, by way of background, uh, my family's from Puerto Rico. And when I think of Latinx and, and being a black man, I think of my great grandmother who lived to 111 years old and she passed away in 2004. Uh, so she lived through three different centuries and she was part of Puerto Rico before it was a Commonwealth. She didn't know how to read or write, but when she got the ability to vote, she made sure that her ex counted. And as a child, we would go as a family to vote. It would be my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, my aunts. And I grew up in a small community in Manhattan's Low East Side. I was over-policed, over-policed to the effect that as a kid, I, I thought voting was just something that women do. I, I thought it was something that you had to be feminine to do, right? My father, by way of background, is formerly incarcerated. So growing up, he was in prison. Many of the men in my neighborhood were disengaged from the system because they had a felony conviction. And, and as a young boy going to my school on a day off, wasn't ideal. I, I didn't want to go to the polls, right? I didn't want to go pull the levers with my grandmother, my mother. I didn't want to have to be the translator. Uh, but what that did was it showed me how democracy worked. It gave me a snapshot on how we have systems in place that disenfranchise people. To think about a young child who's in elementary school thinking that voting is just something that women do. And what does that do to the over 700,000 people we have in jails today and in prisons who have children who are unable to go and vote in many places, right? And what does it mean for rights restoration? Or what does it mean that the Constitution does not inherently say that we all have a right to vote? And I, I bring that perspective and knowing the times that we're in and understanding rights restoration as someone who was on the ground in Florida during Amendment 4 and seeing how that's implemented now to, you know, bringing cases throughout the United States. Uh, as it relates to Latinx people, where we are as a country is, we're as diverse as we've ever been. And I think that diversity brings a new level of hope. We have one third of all eligible voters in 2020 are, are gonna be non-Caucasian. Communities of color for the first time are gonna have a newfound political power. Latinx individuals are gonna represent about 32 million eligible voters. Uh, black voters, non-Latinx are gonna represent around 30 million. And when we add black, brown, and Asian into the factor, we're talking about one third. And when we look at what happened in 2016 and knowing that countless states uh, the difference between who became president was determined by less than 1% of those people in those states. It, it's really a time where, for the first time, you need uh, the Latinx vote, you need the Black vote, um, but you also need to understand that our communities are not monolithic, that we are many cultures, um, but that we care about this country, that we help build this country, and that we're in a time where people are saying, I'm American and you can't stop me from participating. And there's a newfound freedom and hope in understanding that for the first time, our votes could truly make a difference. For the first time, we're seeing young people that are gonna be the number one voting block in the country, right? This is the first time where we see presidential campaigns not talking about elections as it relates to retirement. I, I haven't heard anyone's platform on retirement. I can tell you what people's platforms are around student debt, right? That's because of the time that we're living in. The sure. fact that we have major platforms saying Black Lives Matter, 
and that Black lives matter doesn't mean that you're not saying other people's lives do not matter, but that we're acknowledging that systemic oppression and systemic racism has been a part of our country. And with one third of all eligible voters being from a place that has traditionally been, been disenfranchised, this is the first time that we're seeing major platform candidates uh, engage in a way that they haven't in the past. Yeah. And, and for this semester, what I'm looking forward to is just bringing that to the classroom, bringing that to the forum, yeah. talking about how do you mobilize? How do you organize? How do we get to November? But what happens after November? And, and as you mentioned, we're in a decennial census year uh, yeah. and the important intersect between the census and democracy. It's the most important piece of document that we have to quantify how many people live in our country. It's written in our constitution. And understanding that $700 billion are distributed based on census data. Understanding that our schools, private businesses, all depend on census data. Understanding that for communities of color, being an entrepreneur is a way of life, it's survival. And that when you go into a bank and you try to take out a loan, the one thing they want to know about is who are your potential customers? What's your buying block? Who's going to support you? And what they look to is census data. Uh, Chaston and I had a conversation maybe earlier today or yesterday just talking about the arts in school, right? And how schools are being defunded and the first thing to go are the arts. Well, we know that that's directly tied to the census. And what I'm looking forward to the most is just learning from the students, sharing my life story, reminding people that you have power, you have authority. It's okay not to know what you want to do in life. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to be in a time where you're wondering what's really going on. Is this really going on? And not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, but I'm proud and happy to be here. Thank you for excited having me. that you are here. And it's uh it's inspiring all six of you to have us here. And we want to jump right into to student questions. Um, and the first up is Eric. Eric, identify yourself and ask your question. It's great to see you, Eric. Thanks, Mark. Uh, first off, just want to say it's incredible to see this fellows class come together and want to give a quick shout out to Addy James and Emily Brother, who do a lot of the work with FSG behind the scenes, and to Kareen, who's the incredible chair of well, this program. Right back at you, Eric, because you are a great <laughs> co-chair that brought this class in. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so my name's Eric. I'm a senior at the college, currently taking this semester off to work on some youth voter registration efforts in Philadelphia. Um, but my question for all of you is a simple one. Um, I'm really just curious to know with so much going on right now uh, in our country and in the world, there are certainly so many places that you all could be. Um, but I'm really curious to know, what is it specifically about young people, about Gen Z or millennials in general that brings you to the IOP uh, this semester? And, and what element of engaging with students are you most excited for through your study groups? So let me just, um, because you're working in Philadelphia, uh, we'll ask Mary Nutter and then we'll get another student question. And if that's okay, Eric, Mary Nutter. Well, first, Eric, thank you uh, for, uh, for doing your work in Philadelphia. We certainly, uh, we certainly need it. Uh, I'm here because uh, A, I've just had a number of incredible experiences at Harvard over a pretty extended a period of time. Way before I was a fellow, I came to Harvard uh, on a couple of occasions uh, to, uh, to speak or participate on a panel or something like that. So I know the quality uh, and the commitment uh, that's made, but uh, at least equal to that, if not more, uh, it's actually because of you all. Um, you know, as uh, uh, we were on a call earlier, and I, I think it was, uh, I think it may have been Jorge uh, made mention of, um, you know, before before you all put the boomers out to uh, out to pasture, um, you know, we, we still have a few things that we'd like to offer. Uh, and uh, but I love the learning. I learn from you all. Uh, I get uh, enriched uh, by your thoughts, by the way you think. Uh, about things and then try and often it will shape reshape uh, the things that I'm thinking about or talking about so uh, I, I get a lot from all of you and it is the main reason why uh, I love being up at Harvard and the IOP in particular. Perfect. Great I see Victor's up next for a student question Victor welcome. 
Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you all for being here. Um, so I, my name is Victor. I'm a sophomore at the college, um, zooming in from Lake Tahoe, California, under the fog of the smoke. Um, but Carol actually, um, during the reception earlier, was talking about Connecticut. Um, it was making me miss home because I'm originally from Connecticut. Um, and that made me think about something that I had heard uh, Chasten talk about before, um, and the idea of, of finding power in your story. Um, I know that you um, talked about finding that through the campaign, um, and that was one of the overarching goals that, that you achieved there. Um, so I would love to hear both from Chasten and from the other fellows, instances where you have um, found that power in your story um, and used it to, to mobilize um, some sort of change. Chasten. Thanks, Victor. Uh, I really appreciate that question. So when I was out on the campaign trail, like I mentioned, I first thought that you had to like be a certain way to be a political spouse. And then I realized the most powerful conversations I was having um, was just talking about my own truth and lived expectations. Often uh, our lived experiences, excuse me, with young people um, about topics which I feel like we're all told not to talk about because if we do talk about them, if we do talk about those experiences, it makes us weaker. And so I talked about my own suicidal thoughts as a gay teenager growing up in a conservative place. I talked about my own mental health. I talked about uh, my experience with sexual assault. I put it all out on the table and told people, this is who I am and those things don't define me. They sure shaped me, but they do not define who I am. In order to bust a stigma, bust many stigmas, because I never saw people in positions of power with platforms speaking about those things. And I think it's really important that we, if we do have the power, if we do have the ability, open up about those types of things because Alice mentioned it and Carol mentioned it. We don't always see people on television talking about things that make us feel truly understood and seen. And so if, if you have it in you, if you feel like you are able to share that with other people, it will save other people's lives just by offering space and telling people that they are worthy of taking up space. And I know speaking of taking up things, I don't wanna take up a lot of time, but I think it's really important that we find that strength if we can and share it with other people. Thank you, Chester. Next student uh, questioner is up. I'm looking at the screen. Who is up next? Hunte Troy. Hello. Uh, my name is Hyunte. I am a first year at the college, and I'm zooming in from Strauss on campus. Um, and I had a question for Carol and Alice. Um, I was active in high school in journalism and especially writing opinions articles. I think my favorite part of writing articles was kind of seeing the reaction and having conversations with people who, you know, read um, our, our articles and um, you know, just being in dialogue with people. And I was wondering what has been the most important or unexpected criticism you've gotten from your journalism work? Alice, do you want to start us? Um, well, I, I think when I was a journalist, I was a journalist and, and it was straight down the middle. You'd have, when I was in I was a new, started out in a newspaper in college and then did radio and then television. But as a TV journalist, you have 90 seconds to tell your story. And I really stro strived really hard to, you know, give 45 seconds to the one side and 45 seconds to the other and, and, and straight down the middle. And, and I think a lot of times people would get frustrated that they didn't get more time or they didn't, um, you know, get more of their, their say in. But I, I really, really strive to be straight down the middle. And um, as much as I was courts and politics, I really loved the, the telling the people stories. And, and when I was given a political story, I would go find a, a real person to, to tell the story. And, um, you know, one that stands out, we were doing a story on um, foster care and, and children in foster care. And I did a story, this girl was separated from her brother and we did her story and come to find out the brother that was separated 40 years ago happened to see it and they were reunited. So uh, I think when you are able to tell people stories and get to know real people and make a difference, that, that's the that's better to me than, you know, covering some political case or some campaign. The, the people are really what matters. Great. Great. I care really have a little time before we wrap up. Uh, any reflections as a journalist? Uh, two. One, when I was uh 
very young starting out as a journalist and I was covering City Hall in Hartford. And, uh, you know, there weren't many women uh, covering politics at the time. There weren't many women journalists at the time. And, you know, I was just had my head down, was trying to work hard, do a good job. And I got word that uh, I was being criticized for my work because I was uh, I was having an affair with a, a city councilman. It wasn't true, but it completely flattened me because it was such a lie, and I never expected that kind of an attack. I mean, criticize my story, but you know, don't try to undermine me by this kind of ad hominem attack. And the other example I would cite is much later when I was on the editorial board of the New York Times, and I write, wrote all the editorials about Iran, you know, um, and we, we were very supportive of the Iran nuclear deal. And, um, uh, and I, there's a group of people on Twitter who, who started to beat up on me, accusing me of being anti-Israel, which of course I'm not, um, but, uh, you know, it, it that was tough to kind of push back on too, but it's all part of the job. Thank you for the question. Thank you for all the great answers. I think everyone can readily understand why we're so excited to have this group of fellows. And I thank each and every one of them to Brittany and Mir Nutter and Chaston and Alice and Jorge and, and Carol. We, we thank you most sincerely. Uh, we invite everyone to join us next Tuesday at six o'clock here in the forum where we'll have a very fascinating conversation on the rise of hate from 9-11 to today, and addressing the issues of extremist ideology, both at home and abroad. So we hope you'll have that on your calendars for Tuesday. So with that, again, with our gratitude to Corrine and to our student leadership uh, to bring the fellows here, and certainly to my colleagues, uh, Abby and Emily, thank you all so much for joining us. Have a good night, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, get a plan to vote. Take care, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.